I will admit that uh, LinkedIn is um, my playground. So sometimes I get a bit carried away and I throw I throw the rule book off the window and simply write what I want because um, this is why I started my newsletter. This is why I started my consulting business. I wanted to do something that has my face on it and my voice on it. I didn't want to be constrained by a brand voice. So I want to write what I care about. And uh, I was very happy to find out I'm not the only one who cares about those things, you know. Hey, if you're new to the show, I'm Eric Milcher, and I have lighthearted conversations with founders and marketers about their journey building and scaling startups here in Europe. My guest today is Adriana Tika. She is a no BS, zero hacks marketing strategist, and her digital marketing agency, Copyright Tech, helps tech companies reach their goals by providing SEO and copywriting services. And she also writes the ideas to power your future newsletter, where every week she teaches you in 10 minutes or less ideas on how to build a sustainable business. I'm really excited to chat with Adriana. Adriana, so when it comes to content creators, what are you seeing now in the B2B space? And what does it mean for B2B in general, Adriana? Um, the biggest trend I've, I've been seeing for a couple of years now is... Um, the blurring of the lines between B2B and B2C. I think we finally understood that uh, there's no reason to uh, to create such a such a harsh line between the two, you know, because essentially B2B buyers are also human. So perhaps a better approach than this very clear division would be H to H, human to human, you know. You need to understand that between every B2B purchase decision, there's a human or several humans, and you need to talk to them. A company, whether it's a startup or a Fortune 500 corporation, is uh, more or less a convention, a fictional entity, you know? It's the humans that drive it. So this is who you're talking to. So whether you're selling uh, shoes or whether you're selling uh, technical products for, for companies, you're talking to humans. It's, uh, it's their needs, it's their problems that you need to solve. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of those things that you need to be reminded of if you've ever taken a really good copywriting course. And I remember Ash saying that, listen, you write to one person and it, you forget that a lot. And I forget that all the time. And I'm thinking, you know, my client is a typical SaaS business, probably 200 minimum employees. That's how I'm really targeting. And so I, I just have that in mind when I start writing and I, I, I'm completely dropping the ball here. So what are some things that when you work with clients that are in the tech space or even just clients that are copywriters that are writing, like freelancers that are writing for those type of clients, any sort of tips you know, to, to remind them that you're really reminding, you're really, really writing to one person, a human, a human approach. Well, there's the old approach, the talking to your buyer persona, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit obsolete because we finally understood that marketing Mandy who likes her Starbucks frappuccinos and so on is maybe not the best, the best person to, to talk to. And maybe everything she likes in her spare time isn't relevant. But uh, one one of my go tos, for instance, when I when I write my newsletter, is to imagine that I write to a single subscriber. A subscriber. I actually look for my list of subscribers, pick one name, and think, "Hey, I'm writing to you." It's like, uh, "Hey, this newsletter, I'm writing it to Eric." What would Eric want to know? What would Eric not care about? Because this is a very big problem that most copywriters forget about. You know, you, yeah. you tend to cram everything into a single page, into a single blog post. Some some stuff needs to go. You need to kill your darlings, as, as we like to say. Delete mercilessly. But uh, I think that imagining the single person that you're writing to and making sure that you know exactly what their pain points are and what you're talking about will help you zero in and write only what your what your audience ne what your audience needs to know. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay. Do you apply the same approach when you're when you're writing LinkedIn posts? Adriana? Yes, but uh, I will admit that uh, LinkedIn is um, my playground. So sometimes I get a bit carried away and I throw I throw the rule book off the window and simply write what I want because um, this is why I started my newsletter. This is why I started my consulting business. I wanted to do something that has my face on it and my voice on it. I didn't want to be constrained by a brand voice. So I want to write what I care about and uh I was very happy to find out I'm not the only one who cares about those things, you know. A lot of people resonate with them. Yeah. So 
maybe this may sound surprising, but when you throw the rule book off the window and uh, you write in your own voice without any constraints, without any frameworks, uh, these things resonate more with your audience because they can feel that they come from a place of authenticity and honesty, which is very, very rare, even on social media. Yeah, yeah. Hey, marketers can laugh listeners. Before we dive back into the conversation, I've got a game changer for your content strategy. Imagine a world where the headache of coordinating, reviewing, and approving content for social media, blogs, and newsletters just disappears. That's right. If you're struggling with team collaboration on content, and we've all been there, it's precisely why you need to hear about this tool. It's called Planable. It's revolutionizing the way teams collaborate on content. Picture this, crafting and seeing your posts exactly as they'll appear live across different platforms, all from one dashboard. And the beauty of it? it drastically cuts down the approval time for your posts. What used to take hours can now be wrapped up in minutes. Whether you call Planable your unfair advantage or your secret weapon in your content creation toolbox, it's changing the content collaboration game. With its beautifully designed interface, you'll wonder how you ever did content planning without it. Ready to upgrade and streamline your approach to content creation? Head over to Planable.io and sign up for a free plan today. That's Planable.io. And here's the cherry on top. Planable is giving you 30% off for the first three months when you upgrade to any plan that fits your needs. That's right, any plan. All you need to do is use the code Planable30 at checkout and you're all set to transform the way you manage your marketing content. That's Planable30 to lock your 30% discount for the first three months. Can we go back to about blurring the lines a little bit? Uh, what B2B is starting, the, a lot of the marketing they're starting to do is, is kind of like the B2C. Can you give some examples like that? Any, any companies stand out or maybe even uh, specific people that stand out that, are, that seem to be doing a good job of this? So in the, um, in the SaaS space, you can look at Groove HQ. They have a very trans transparent built-in public approach. Um, Basecamp is also a very good example here. They are their companies, they're not personal brands, but they are personal brand led, especially Groove HQ. Uh, Alex at Groove HQ, it's, uh, it's his uh, Twitter, well, X handle. He built his company uh, fully transparently. He blogs a lot. He gives you everything behind the scenes. Uh, he tells you in-depth stories about the things they messed up, about the things that are working for them. And through this approach, they managed to attract a lot of clients. It's a very human to human approach it's yeah. not your usual corporate lingo this is what we're doing we care about people we care about the environment yeah. it's not we it's i mostly i and uh at Basecamp, it's pretty much the same thing maybe you don't have a single human that uh that everyone knows about perhaps there are still more more people who know the Basecamp brand rather than the founders names uh, but their story from the very beginning how they started Basecamp, what they're launching now the, their new project once is very very human you know they 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 talk about what they saw in the market the the gaps they're trying to cover they're very honest about it and they talk to humans you know their their newest project once is going to be an anti sas uh it's going to be a pay once and own forever so it's a bit a bit of a time travel and they explained very clearly why they're doing it, because they started noticing that a lot of people started to hate their monthly subscriptions who quickly add up and you forget about them and you end up paying for 10 services that you haven't used since last Christmas. Yeah. So uh, it's these approaches that give you a, a little bit of um, of an inside view, a sneak peek into, uh, into the company's operations. And it's more than usual. It's You know, it's not the... The quick approach you uh, you usually you usually have with big corporations like does anyone know what's happening at Unilever what they're testing now what they're doing or I, I don't want to call them out I have nothing against the <laughs> first name that uh, popped in my head the same the same goes for the big tech companies like yeah. uh, Meta or uh, Google or X well that's a good example for anything good or or yeah. wrong right now I mean. The founders talk about what, what they're launching and why, but it's still very press release-like, even if it's yes. a social media post. You yes, know? yes. You know, when I used to work for corporate America, like big companies um, back in Texas, 
I used to love the CEO where every Friday it started with just like an email and it, it was like maybe three or four things that he covered that the company that they were focused on that he was focused on. But then he turned it into like this, this blog video and you just go to YouTube and it was a private link and it was typically a five minute video. And he was talking um, about the things that, you know, he was thinking about or just the company in general. And I love that. I love that. And that was, oh God, maybe less than 10 years ago. But a lot of companies haven't moved to that in terms of external communication and sharing it with the public, right? And I, I think maybe a lot of people are just uncomfortable uh, doing that. Uh, maybe they feel like it's not really worth it, or maybe they feel like I just don't have the time. So the brands that you've mentioned, like Basecamp and some of the other ones who seem to be getting it right, right? Have you ever worked with companies where you've tried to like nudge them toward that direction? And have you been successful and, and what were you successful in getting them to do in, in, in terms of taking that approach or in that mindset? Like where would um, they start if they've never done anything like that before? So I would say that my success has been moderate. <laughs> Some people have completely refused to, to take a more transparent approach. Uh, for instance, I briefly worked, um, well, my agency briefly worked with a client who wanted to create great content to become a thought leader in their space. And their definition of thought leadership was cramming a ton of fancy phrases and words into a single blog post. And whatever we created for them, they said, uh, no, we need to crank it up. We need to crank it up. But it means nothing anymore. Yeah. It's just a lot of synergies and seamlessness. And <laughs> that means nothing anymore. Why would you do that? Yeah. Um, but yes, I've also had the clients who were very, very open to this approach, even though they themselves weren't comfortable on camera or weren't comfortable talking about themselves and uh, why they got into business. And they preferred to let the brand shine, uh, shine on its own. They were open to sharing more of their operations, more than was, you know, required to keep the company going. I we we now have a client in uh, in the IPS industry, uh, integration platform as a service. Their name is Syncaps, and they're doing a great job at uh, putting themselves out there and explaining everything they do with with its ups and downs. And um, their entire journey is very, very transparent in the way they support their customers. What I think is uh, very interesting about this approach is that when you start doing it, you also start doing what everyone says they do, but they actually don't. You actually implement the feedback from your customer. If you're transparent yeah. about what you do and why you build this feature and why you decided not to build the other feature, you're actually creating those feedback loops that you stick with. Most companies are going to tell you, well, I think all companies are going to tell you, hey, for them. But that's just PR talk. Yeah. When you become more transparent and less people in, I mean, actually let them in. Yeah. Uh, then you also start implementing feedback because it's it's a it's a dual uh, it's a it's dual, dual communication way. relationship. It's a two way street. Yep. Yep. Okay. Love it. Okay. Next question for you, Adriana. Since being becoming a solopreneur, I found it beneficial to create checklists and playbooks for different functions in my business. For example, when a B two B podcaster joins my network, I go through a series of steps like inviting them to my Slack group, sending them a calendar invite to our monthly meetups, adding their details in a Notion doc, things like that. And these checklists have been a big help in terms of uh, protecting me from forgetting a step or forgetting to do something. What are some tools or things that you do to help avoid needless menial tasks or delegate or automate parts of your business? Oh, I love processes and SOPs. I think they're they're so uh, they're so important to to keeping your business on track, especially as a solopreneur, where you don't have as many people to delegate to. You know. Yeah. So one of the things I I started doing recently is I created a spreadsheet that's called Problems. It's a very ominous name, but the spreadsheet itself is very very helpful. Um, the way I use it is that um, is after each call or whether it's a strategy session with my client, whether it's a Zoom call with my friend, whether it's a podcast like this one, I take five minutes to write down every problem my chatting partner talked to me about, you know? I try to identify the bigger picture around it. For instance, if, if someone asks me uh, about um, finding the right uh, product market fit, I I make sure I, I label it with, with a larger problem, okay, for it. Um, and um, I, I write down the name of whoever asked me about that, when they did it, what was the context. And at the very end, 
I think about a piece of content that I, I can create for that problem and maybe a product eventually. Uh, this is one of my most helpful resources right now because uh, if you keep if you keep at this for a couple of months, you're going to see patterns from different people. And this is a very strong signal that you need to either create more content around that topic or create mm -hmm. a product to to help people people solve them. I have various spreadsheets and calendars and um, frameworks and templates that I use for pretty much everything I do from newsletters to content writing to the way I approach a, a strategy session with my clients because it's very important when you when you show up for your client to know exactly what you need to do, what you need to ask, what you need to tell them, uh, your pre-session prep and so on. So Yeah. yeah. Yeah, instead of waiting to being on the actual call um, and like like the discovery phase, uh, what sort of pre work do you do before the call that you have with the client, with a potential new client? Do you ask anything like on the Calendly invite? Like, are there any field tech, you know, boxes or any questions that you ask beforehand? Well, it depends if it's uh, if it's for my uh, agency. I typically stalk them a bit before the before the session. <laughs> I make sure I know everything there is to know about them, at least the public information. Uh, I have other competitors, so during the discovery call, I have a few pertinent questions to, to ask. If it's a strategy session in my consulting business, I have a few questions in my calendar that, that help me prep before the session. So before the session starts, I'm going to have a Google document with suggestions for my client, and we're going to discuss them uh, during the call. So I don't show up empty-handed, you know, and... Uh, and tell people, hey, can you please remind me your name? I, I think that's so off-putting, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, minimum, I mean, uh, minimum 30 minutes, at, at least for like a potential client, m minimum. Uh, you could probably do a lot Absolutely. more than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so Adriana, I, I just launched B2B Pod Pros. Uh, we provide SaaS companies an easy way to reach marketing leaders in the B2B space by a podcast. I'm trying to build an audience that could be potential clients. You recently conducted the Audience Accelerator Workshop where you teach people actionable frameworks they can use to build an audience. What are some things that, that you teach and hope students take away from your workshop and implement? Oh, I do have a couple of hours. No, I'm joking. So uh, there are a ton of frameworks and of course there's no one size fits all in marketing or in audience building. But if you're trying to build an audience for a podcast, I think the, uh, the best... Uh, the best two ideas you can start implementing are creating an email list that complements the podcast. Uh, you can use that email list to send the transcript of your podcast, to announce the new topics, to announce the new guests, and so on. And lastly, it's, uh, the favorite thing I taught in my in my recent workshop is uh, to create um, self-feeding growth loops. We tend to think about audiences in silos, like here's my audience on LinkedIn, these are my email subscribers, these are the people who listen to my podcast. And if you have more than one platform, you're going to mainly focus on one of them. For me, for instance, it's it's my newsletter. I, I use all of my other platforms to draw people to my email list. But also from my emails, I, I send people to my social media platforms or I tell them about the podcasts I've been a guest on. Mm -hmm. And I think these self-feeding growth loops can be incredibly helpful no matter what you build. Yeah. So you can use your podcast to ask people to connect with you on social media, to ask people to subscribe to your email list. You can use their social media to get people to your podcast and so on and so forth. The goal of these self-feeding growth loops is that um, no one is that mm, none of your messages are going to reach everyone in your audience, not even your emails, because not everyone opens all your emails. Right, right, right. right. So you want to make sure that uh, every audience member follows you on more than one platform so that you have a chance to target them with uh, with everything you you put out there. And this yeah. is especially true on social media where you know how organic reach is these days. You, you can hardly count on it. So yes, this is if you if you want to build a, a strong community around your podcast, self uh, self feeding growth loops are a great idea. And also perhaps a, a private community to connect yeah. people because you're talking about, about B2B marketers and uh, B2B founders. And typically these people are a bit isolated and they, they could always benefit from, from a strong community of peers. 
Yeah, yeah. No, that's one of the reasons why I created the B2B podcaster community uh, and, and, and everybody enjoys it. We learn from each other. We support one another. Uh, one of the things, like you were saying, I started doing, and I don't know if it's going to work or not, but in a new blog post that I publish, I'll actually, like in the blog post itself, I'll include a screenshot of a LinkedIn post that I wrote about that pertains to whatever that topic is in the blog. And if people found it interesting and the screenshot includes like the number of comments and engagements and likes, and it was a pretty popular post, maybe they'll read that and think, oh, okay, I'm not following this guy on LinkedIn. They click it and they go to my LinkedIn profile and maybe they'll, they'll see more of my content there or decide to follow me there. Um, but I just started doing that recently. And I think it's one of those growth loops that you mentioned where you're trying to draw people from maybe one platform to another platform where they could follow you. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another question for you. I'm not as famous as you online uh, from a LinkedIn engagement perspective, <laughs> but I do believe that as your audience starts to grow, so do more sales, more proposals, more friends and partnerships. And it's definitely worked out for me uh, with the podcast because the majority of guests that I have on the show, I've met through LinkedIn. Uh, Adriana, is there a dark side to growing an online audience? And if so, can you give some examples? Oh, yes. So uh, I think the most common dark side is uh, the hate you're starting to get. We we have this penchant for hating popular people. We love to root for underdogs, but the moment they they start, they start becoming real dogs, we kind of hate them. And we, we try to figure out how they game the system, what do they do, and... Uh, what did they do wrong to get there? Yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of hate, a lot of uh, weird, lewd DMs that you're going to get, to, including marriage proposals or unsolicited. You've been proposed to, Adriana? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. See, you have crushes. Well, yeah, that, that actually happened before I became a solopreneur. I was a freelancer and I, I was proposed to. I was, uh, along with a marriage proposal, came uh, the a job offer of uh, running a clothing factory in Pakistan. Okay. I I, I declined. So th this is why I'm not uh, a retail mogul right now. But yeah, joke aside, uh, another dark side of having a large audience is that it can pretty much eat up all of your time. If you, if you still want to reply to every comment and every DM that you get, you won't have time to do anything else. Yeah, I, I really don't want to show you how, um, what my my LinkedIn notifications look like right now. Yeah, I have really old DMs that I'm trying to get to. I I do want to reply to everyone, but uh, I also need to learn to put a hard stop to my to my social media activity because otherwise, you know, there's no time to sleep. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I put like a, a little clock on my, my iPhone, uh, like a countdown timer and say, okay, this is how much I'm going to spend. But once it goes off, I need to walk away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. There you have but it, folks. You, know, because, <laughs> because, uh, you know, people take time to engage with your content, to send you a message and you kind of, you want to reply because, you know, they're nice and they're part of your audience and you want to show up for them. Yeah. But after some point, you really can't reply to everyone. It's it's unsustainable. It's yeah, and it's so true about once people get like like a certain uh, level of success, whether it's measured by the number of uh, followers or something, you you do tend to hate them. I guess it's just it's just being human. I, I tend to not really follow anybody with more than twenty thousand followers, and it's not so much the number. It's just more of like, you know, I've read some of their posts more than one, and it starts off with. Oh, you know, I've made five hundred thousand dollars now for my business, and blah blah. It's like, okay, you're in a different place than I am, and that's not exactly what I'm going for, or the kind of content that I re want to read. And I just stop following that person altogether, even if they're trying to share valuable tips and stuff. It's just sort of puts, for me, it's just putting off. Okay, I've got some rapid fire questions for you. Are you ready, Adriana? Yes, ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> okay. What is the most interesting thing you have done in the last 26 days? 26. Wow. I've been to a really cool wine tasting. Okay. Okay. Where was this at? Uh, it was set in uh, Bucharest, really close to my home. I'm very lucky to have the best wine bar in Bucharest next to me. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it was amazing. 
Okay, good, good, good. I'm going to have to ask you about that when we start recording here. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. When you were a kid, you wanted to be blank. Fill in the blank. I wanted to be a sales clerk because uh, I thought that if you, <laughs> I thought that sales clerks had access to all the sweets in the, in their shop for free. I was really, really disappointed <laughs> when I was told I, I can't have all I can eat. So you did get a job at uh, at a play at such a place at one point in your life. No, I did not. If it didn't come with the purse I wanted, I didn't yeah. want the job. Yeah, you know, I was talking to my wife the other day, and she was saying that her dream job would be working at, oh God, what was it? I don't know if it was Louis Vuitton or one of those like fancy things, just so that she could get the discount off the clothes. <laughs> so, like, okay, all right. Uh, next question for you: What is the best advice that your mom or dad or somebody close to you ever gave you? To pass the exam, you have to show up. It's the first condition. Uh, it happened when I was in college and I was really dreading this complicated exam. And uh, my mom told me, you know, if if you don't go, if you don't go, you're definitely not going to pass. So yeah. at least try. And it's something I've carried with me throughout my career because the first thing you need to do is show up. You'll figure it out once you, once you show up. Okay. Uh, what's the biggest win that you've had in the last 12 months, Adriana? I think it was my uh, audience accelerator workshop that I that I held recently. I kind of blew through all my goals and I had a fantastic session with amazing people, gave me amazing feedback and they made it actionable. And yeah. It was more than I, than I ever hoped for. Well, it was last night. I signed up for it and unfortunately I couldn't attend, but how did it go? Oh, it went great. If you signed up for it, you're going to get the, the recording. We, we went a bit over time, but uh, it was great. I really, really loved it. Okay. Okay. Last question for you. Blank is a contest or a game or a challenge. I have won. I, I didn't win many things in my life, so <laughs> I won... Uh, a journalism prize when I was in uh, when I was in college, I submitted a small article for um, a TV contest, and it got read in prime prime time, and my name was on <laughs> on national television. Adriana, where should people go if they want to learn more about you? the best uh, the best way to to get my best resources is to sign up to my newsletter. You can find it on uh, adrianatico.com slash newsletter. You can also find me on LinkedIn, X, and, and Threads. Um, I post on almost daily on LinkedIn. And yeah, I'm very easy to find online. I'm yeah. sure We'll include li links to Adriana's LinkedIn profile and uh, as well as her newsletter. Uh, for me, if you want to get examples of B2B podcast ads, some really good examples, just go to b2bpodpros.com. Adriana, this was a pleasure having you on the show. Same here, Ari. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, no, my pleasure for everybody listening. You enjoy this, please pay it forward, tell others about it, and subscribe to the show. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube or Spotify or Apple. Until next week, I'll continue interviewing innovating marketers and founders here in Europe. Thank you.